Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch. This is the first of two videos where I'm going to go over two different foundation classes in Swift, the date formatter and the number formatter. In this video, I'll focus on the date formatter and also introduce you to the calendar struct that works closely with it. We'll learn how to convert between dates and their textual representations and vice versa. If this is something you want to learn, then keep watching. To keep me focused, I've created a simple playground, and you can download it from the link in the description below. There are three pages, and none of them have much in them, but I have sectioned off my examples using a code closure function. What this function allows me to do is to keep all of my code separated, and allows me to, because the code is in a closure, use the same variables over again without having to worry about name conflicts and it keeps my printouts to the console really nice and organized. This public function is found in the Sources folder, and if you've watched some of my other videos that use Playgrounds, you may have seen this before. It's a technique that I borrowed from the Ray Wenderlich videos. I've also created a static enum and an extension to the dateformatter.style that I will discuss more once we get to that section. So let's get started. As the introduction states here, date and this is taken directly from the Apple documentation, is a value that encapsulates a single point in time. It represents a time interval relative to an absolute reference date. And there are many methods and properties that we will explore in order to understand the complexity and power of dates and how we can represent them in our code in a way that makes sense to our users. That representation will be as a string value, and for that, we'll use the date formatter class for Swift. So there's a lot to learn, so buckle up. We'll need a date to work with, and the easiest one to explore is one that represents this exact moment in time. You see, date is more than a day, month, and a year. It also includes the time right down to the second. If we initialize a date object with no arguments, it defaults to the moment in time when it is instantiated. So let's create one at the top of our playground that we'll call now, and we can use that in all of our code blocks. So within our code block in the first example, let's print out now. And we'll see it prints out a date looking like this. The format of this date is based on my device's language and location settings. It also represents the time at Greenwich Mean Time location, or GMT, and that's plus 0000 in the offset from this location. It's not very helpful, as if I were later on in the day, it would appear that the day of the month is one day later. We need a way to represent our date according to the time zone and language that the user has set on her device. And there are many ways to represent our date, but in order to do that, we need to create an instance of the date formatter class. So for convenience, I'll call it date formatter. This object's properties allows us to define how we want to represent our date. And the most consistent way to do that is to use the dates, date style, and time style properties. So let's start with date formatter dot date style. And if we option click on date style to show the quick help and then open in developers documentation, we'll see that it is a date formatter dot style object. And we can drill down on that and see that it's a constant that specifies a predefined format for dates and times. It's an enum and there are five options. So let's pick one and assign it to our date formatter's date style. How about starting with full? Now, in order to print out our date, we need to use the string from date method on date formatter. And for our date, we'll use our now instance of the date that we just created. We see that no time is provided, it's just the date. And depending on where you live, what you see may be entirely different. And I'll get into this a little bit more later. We'll change the date style enum to another one and see how it prints. If I choose none, notice how nothing gets printed on the console. Let me change it back to full. In order to add the time to our printout, we need to specify a time style property. And if we show the quick help once more, we see that it too is the same type as applied to our date style. So we can use short. The appearance of the time will be either 12 hour or 24 hours, depending on how you have your system set up. 
If I change this to full, I get my time zone showing up as well. There's another date formatter property called locale, which specifies the country or location. Let's examine what it would look like in another locale. First, we'll create our date formatter. And then I'm going to use the locale property of date formatter, which is an instance of the locale struct. Now, locale has a property called identifier, which is the language code for all of the locales supported by Apple. And we can see a list of these by printing out the static available identifiers property. There are lots of them. I'm going to pick one that's different from my locale, and I'm going to choose DE, which represents Germany. And I'll also make sure that the date style is set to full to print out the full string representation. Notice how, comparing to my previous printout, which defaults to my locale, which is EN, that the month and day is reversed and the spelling for the day and month are now the German spelling. In the sources folder, I created the public enum that is all of the date styles along with an extension on dateformatter.style that will just provide me with the string representation of that string enum. So this will allow me to step through each of the date formatter style enums and print out the description and a formatted date to see what they look like in the specified locale. If we run this, we now see that what we get is a nice overview. If you change the locale, you get a different representation of the date. Here in Canada, we use a slash between the date components while others use a period. Also, even amongst English countries, the display is different. In the UK, the format is day slash month slash year. Whereas here in Canada and the US, it is month slash day slash year. Well, let's do the same with time style. I'm going to copy the code from this previous example and just change date style to time style. As you change your locale, you get to see how that locale displays its time. Here in my locale, instead of a 24 hour clock, we distinguish between the morning and afternoon by using a AM PM designation on a 12 hour clock. Another date formatter property is time zones. So let's create another one and set the date and time styles both to long and we'll print out the string representation as before. Now notice that my time zone is represented by PST or Pacific Standard Time. And this is the abbreviation for the time zone identifier. Date formatter has a time zone property that is an instance of the time zone struct, and it can be entered either as an abbreviation or an identifier. If you want to find out what all the identifiers are, you can just print out that static time zone property, the known time zone identifier. There isn't one here that looks like PST though. If we want to see which of these identifiers it represents, we can print out another static property that's called the abbreviation dictionary. Now this is a much shorter list, so not all of the identifiers have abbreviation, but PST, as you see, represents America slash Los Angeles, a city that happens to be in the Pacific Standard Time time zone. So I can use the abbreviation overload on the time zone struct and specify my time zone. And if I want to know the time in another time zone, we can simply specify that locale. So I'm going to find out the date and time in Auckland, New Zealand. And I can see its abbreviation is 
NZST. I see that they're a day ahead of me. Now, the last thing I want to cover in this section is custom formatting. The date formatter has another useful property that is the date format property, and it allows us to bypass the date and time styles and present it any way we like. And there are two great websites for this. The first is how to format date time in Swift, and I'll leave a link to this in the notes below. And it shows us the characters that we can use in a format string to represent our date and time. There's another one called nsdateformatter.com, and it's probably the most used by iOS developers. Here you get to try out your format and choose a locale to get the format you want to use, and a representation of that is displayed. It too has a great reference and best practice section that you should probably read. So back in our code then, we can create a date formatter and also use the date formatter string from date method to print it out. But before the printout, we can establish our date format. So let's start with a full day of the week, which is E, 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 all capitals, followed by a comma, and then a full month, which is capital M, 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 and then a single D for a day, so no zero padding for single digit days, another comma, followed by Y, 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 all lowercase, for the full year. And then for our time, we'll use two digits for each hour, minute and second separated by colons, followed by the AM or PM using just a single A, and then finally ZZZ for the time zone abbreviation. And now we can print that out with that string from date method and see that we get our date. Great. Let's move on now to the reverse converting strings to dates. I hope you can see that converting from a string to a date is going to potentially cause you all sorts of grief. If your app is being used in different locations, you're going to have to know the locale so that you can interpret the date format. We'll get to this in just a minute, but let's assume that our users are all in Germany, so we know that the locale is DE, and we also know that in Germany, the date in the short date style is represented by dd.mm.yy. I've already created our instance of now. Let's see if we can convert the string for today as I'm recording, the 23rd of December, into a date. So I'll create a sample date string of 23.12.20. I'll let date formatter be the date formatter and I'll specify my date formatter's locale as DE. Now we can create our sample date using the dateformatters.dateFromString method and pass in our sample date string. If I run this now, I get nil. Well, why? Because I forgot to specify the date style. So let's do that now. A date style up short. Now I see when I print it out I get an optional date but it's a valid date. Let me change our date formatters date style to full. This time as I run I'm back to nil. And the lesson to be learned here is that if you're going to force unwrap your date, you had better make sure that your date string is valid based on your date formatter's properties. If we do that, it works. However, if we change our locale to EN and run again, our app crashes because our date format is incorrect. Well, there's a better way to create dates than to guess that the string representation for the locale. What we can use is what's called the date components, and these are based on the user's current calendar selection on their device. So at the top of our playground, underneath the now instance, 
I'm going to create a new constant called calendar that is the calendar structs static current property. Let's create the date components that would create a date representing Christmas for the year 2025, which is a few years in the future. So we can start with let Christmas components equals date components, and then get a list of all of the components, and all of them are optional. I'm going to enter our specified calendar first for the calendar, but I'm going to control shift click after each of the commas to set multiple cursors. And then I can then just press return to get a vertical list of all of these properties. It makes it easier to see. Now you could enter specific values in here and leave out those ones that you don't want to use, but I seldom do it that way. I'm going to comment all of these out right now and show you how I would do it. I'll just create an instance of date components with no properties like this and use a variable instead of a constant. And now I can add the properties that I want. So for example, I'll specify the calendar as being our already defined calendar. And because we're going to be accessing the Christmas of 2025, the month is 12. The day is 25, and the year is 2025. Now I can create Christmas using the calendar's date from components method. So if we want to print out this date, we'll need to create a date formatter along with a date and time style. So we'll set that both to be full. And then finally print it out making sure that we force unwrap the date because it's an optional and the date formatter method can't accept an optional. And because we didn't specify a time, we see that the time defaults to the start of the day. So one last example for this section. In British Columbia, where I live, there's a statutory holiday on the third Monday of every month. And I want to know what day of the month that's going to be in 2025. So we can start again by creating our instance of date components and specify the calendar year and month. So the calendar is just our calendar. The year is 2025 and the month February is 2. Now we want to specify which day of the week that is. And that weekday is a number and for us it's 2 for Monday. And in order to specify the third Monday, we can use the weekday ordinal property. So we'll enter 3 here. So we'll create that date using the components And I'll copy the date formatter code from the previous example, and then just change our date to the family day, and print it out. I see it's Monday, February 17th. In this final page, we're going to look at date calculations. For every one, we're going to use the same calendar, date formatter, date style, and time style, so I've created these already outside of our code block so that they have access to it. I've also created a function that will accept a string, which will be our date variable's name and the date, and print it out so that we can clearly see our results. Now there's a great blog post here by Keith Harrison of Use Your Loaf, and I'll leave a link in the description below. But let's explore it here. Date calculations are made by adding or comparing the number of seconds between two dates. For example, if I wanted to create a new date that is one hour from our date right now, I could use this date construction, where we can specify a time interval since now. Well, our time interval is in seconds, and there are 60 times 60 seconds in an hour, so we'll just use that for our interval and as I specified, since is from now. 
So let's use the print formatter function to print now and also print one hour from now so that we can see the comparison. That seems to work. Now this is such a common thing that instead of using that date constructor, we could use another one that has the current date and time built into it. And all we have to do is pass in the time interval. The result is the same. Date also has a couple of properties that might come in handy. For example, you might have a range of dates that you don't know what the latest one is or the earliest one. And if you want to retrieve all dates, you might want to compare those dates to one that's way out there, either in the future or in the past. So the date has two properties called distant past and distant future. So I'm going to create these two dates and use our print function to see what they are. Indeed, that's a long way in the past and the future. The calendar struct has a very useful method, and that is what is called start of day. And you'll see in a minute why it is the case. Let's print out now, and then we'll create a new date called start of day. We'll use this method for now. And print it out too. And we'll see that by comparing these two dates that start of day zeroes out the time and sets it to the beginning of the day. Let's do some more calculations. Let's say you want to set up an appointment for next Monday at 9 a.m. It doesn't matter what the day or time is now, we just want to make sure that the appointment is made for the next Monday at 9. And we're going to use date components for this. Well, we know that the weekday for Monday is 2, and the hour is going to be 9, so we'll specify those two components. Well, we can construct a new date using the calendar next date method with a matching policy of next time, and we're going to match the date components that we've specified. So when we print this out, we'll get that next Monday. Let's say we want to schedule a meeting for exactly one week from now, or seven days, but exactly at noon. Again, we'll use date components, but this time we'll use a date components function on our calendar instance to extract the specific components from an existing date, like now, so that we're going to get the exact day, month, and year from now. So, now components are going to be calendar.dateComponents, and I'll extract the day, month, and year from now. And then I'll add in a new component that will specify the hour of 12. So to form our date a week from now, we'll use these components, and we can use another calendar method called date by adding a value to a set of existing components. So we're going to add the day component with a value of 7 to a date constructed from our now components. And of course, we need to either provide a default or force unwrap our date. As you can see, I am now recording on the 23rd of December, and a week from now will be the 30th. If I want to schedule one two weeks from now, or 14 days away, I can just change the number of days I'm adding as the value. And you can see both month and year roll over nicely. Now, a common task is to calculate the number of days between two dates. Sarun has a nice blog post on this, and I'll put a link in the description below. But let me take you through the process. For example, what if I wanted to calculate the number of days between now and Christmas? So remember, today is the 23rd. First, let me construct a date using date components for Christmas. 
and I'll use this year, so the day is 25, the month will be 12, and the year 2020. And I'll construct my date from those components. Now to calculate the number of days, we'll use the calendar date components method, specifying day as the set of components I want to extract, and now as from and to being Christmas. This returns that set of date components, which is just day, so we can print that particular component out. And it's optional, as it may fail, so let's unwrap that. But wait, this is the 23rd of December, and it's saying that there's only one day until Christmas. And I know there are two, so what's going on? Well, the problem is that this calculates full days. And since we're already in the middle of the 23rd, we don't have a full day. The solution is to always compare starts of day. And I know that because we created Christmas from date components, it's already at the start of the day at 12 a.m. But we can apply our calendar start of day function now to now to get its start of day. Running this once more, we get the correct number of days. Good, I still have time to purchase my wife a gift. I hope Amazon delivers on Christmas Day. Well, the calendar struct has a number of properties and functions that can be very useful in date calculations. And I encourage you to check them out and read the documentation. You might be surprised to find what is available to you. In the next video in this series, We'll do a similar walkthrough on the number formatter, and I encourage you to watch that as well. I have lots of other videos available and in the queue as well, so please check out the rest of my channel. You can also visit my website to see the apps that I have available on the App Store, and visit my GitHub page to see what I have available as public repositories. If you like what you've seen, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And ring the bell to get notified when I post new videos. I'm most active on Twitter, so please follow me there as well to find out what else I'm up to. Thanks for watching.